Welcome to our archaeology presentation tonight, which is entitled What Light from Yonder Pot Breaks? Reconstructing Ceramic and Glass Vessels. My name is Allison and I'm a librarian at St. Mary's County Library and I'll be kind of facilitating the presentation tonight. And our guest speaker tonight is Dr. Jim Gibb. All right, so Jim, are you ready to get started? I am. <clears throat> I decided I'd do a new intro to whenever I give a talk, and that is, I am the proud alumnus of the New York State Public uh, School System and of the New York State Public University System. And I think that, that, that warrants saying from time to time. Okay, uh, so let me share a screen here. Uh, this is kind of going to be uh, an unusual talk uh, in that I think it's the first time that I've talked about methodology rather than results. And I found that you know, over the years, uh, a lot of folks ask me about, well, how do you do archaeology? How do you find sites? You know, how do you learn this stuff? And I find I find the question of how you do archaeology not terribly interesting for me, but uh, folks want to hear about it. So this is my first foray into it. The approach I'm taking here is, you know, when we excavate a site, and I know at least a, a few of the folks attending this evening uh, probably uh, haven't worked in archaeology. Uh, you may not uh, know very much about it. So I'll try to take that into consideration as I'm talking. Typically, when we dig a site, uh, a historic period site, a what we call a domestic site, a site where you know people are living, a house site. We find lots of ceramic and glass vessel sherds. And these are really valuable for archaeologists because we can date them. Uh, they tend not to remain in circulation for very long, so they they tend to represent a particular period better than, say, coins would. You know, a coin could bounce around somebody's pocket for many years. Uh, ceramic and glass vessels, uh, they use mostly around the kitchen. They break, they get thrown out, they have no other use. So it's really the stuff of a lot of archaeology it would be those sherds of ceramics and glass. So I'm going to talk about how we can squeeze more information out of these things, apart from simply identifying them. Uh, and by identifying them, it allows us to approximate how old they are and counting them and comparing them. So let's move along with this here. So uh, I'm going to talk about how we can use ceramics to date sites. And I'm not going to talk a lot about that because uh, the focus is on how do you, how do you uh, get vessels out of sherds? How do you turn all those little sherds into the actual types of vessels, the forms, the, the bottles, the cups, the bowls that people are actually using? I'll be talking about the different ways we can vesselize, that is, turn those sherds into vessels, and uh, a little bit about how we can use that data as compared to uh, straightforward uh, numbers of sherds. If you have a question, uh, hit your um, microphone button and just shout it out. I'm okay with that. I don't mind being interrupted. I interrupt people all the time. I'm a New Yorker. So here's here's sort of a context. You know, digging a site. This happens to be a, um, a early, late, very late seventeenth, early eighteenth century site in uh, southern Anne Arundel. Well, in middle of Anne Arundel County. That's my trowel. That's assured. And just looking at that piece coming out of the ground, I can tell you that is a piece of ceramic that was made in North Devonshire. That's in the West Country of England roughly between 1650 and 1725. So we've got a date. I can also tell you from the shape of it that it's part of what we would call a milk pan. That is a large, broad ceramic pan uh, that was often used for making uh, butter. You pour milk from the cow into it, leave it set for a while in a cool setting, and the cream rises to the top. You skim off the cream, and you churn that into butter. So we learned a couple of things just by uncovering this piece of ceramic. 
From that same site, we uh, have a, a several sherds of what we call North Devon, again, from the same area, West Country of England. But this is called Scrofito. And Scrofito is just Italian for basically scratched. But we, we can recognize this being from North Devon from having looked at uh, museum collections and digging sites where you know, these things are found. And it's decorated. You can see they've, they sort of scratched the design to you know, sort of a folk design. And uh, it's since it's decorated, it probably wasn't used for anything utilitarian. You know, you weren't, you know, mashing potatoes in it or, or, or um, uh, making sauerkraut or anything like that. It's a presentation plate. It's a plate that sat on the table from which you would serve food. But again, it dates to roughly 1650 to 1725. So that's part of the dating. Archaeologists uh, a long time ago, well, in the 1970s, maybe not that long ago, developed the technique of dating a site or dating a deposit within a site based on the range of ceramics that would be recovered from that site or from that deposit. That's called mean ceramic dating. And what we do is on the left-hand side, you can see these different kinds of ceramics uh, that have been identified, that have been studied. We know quite a bit about them. We know the approximate dates during which they were uh, manufactured. And if we have a, a, a type of ceramic that was made between, let's say, 1800 and 1900, the mean date of production would be 1850, right in the middle. So that would be our mean date for that particular ceramic type. The second column from the left, the count, those are the number of sherds we recovered of each of those ceramic types from a particular site. What we do is, here, here's, here's the tricky mathematics here. We multiply the number of sherds by the mean date and it gives us a product in the far right-hand side. We add up all those products to get a number. In this case, the number is kind of meaningless, really. What is that? 1,130,163? We take that number and we divide it by the number of, total number of sherds, which is 67. And that gives us a date of 1774.196. So late, late February, 1774. Now, that's an approximate. It just says that you know, that's sort of the mean date during which the site was occupied. We don't know the range. We don't know when it was first occupied, when that site was abandoned. All this number tells us is that, you know, the middle of the occupation period was probably around 1774. And this is from Bel Air Mansion, which is a um, mansion site in Bowie, Maryland, Prince George's County. And these ceramics come from a particular area around a, a, a particular part of that site. And the date is kind of pretty consistent with what we think those deposits date. We have other means of dating. So it's fairly reliable. Uh, some other sherds. This came from a site that I spoke about, I think, sometime last year. The Mill Branch site, the Go Plantation. And these are just some of the things we found. But these are... Uh, porcelains. They're, these are Chinese porcelains. So they're imported from East Asia, and they wound up on this site, not in great numbers. It's a small percentage of ceramic uh, assemblage. But you can see they're all painted, you know, decorated, different scenes, very um, uh, Chinese, East Asian kind of uh, motifs these on them. And we can date these too, roughly. And when we find these things, they usually date between roughly 1750 and about 1830. But the fact that these people had Chinese porcelain, you know, ceramics imported all the way from China, tells us something about these folks. If you look at those ceramics, though, you have to wonder, well, okay, it's Chinese porcelain, but what were they used for? Are they teacups? Are they tea bowls? Or, you know, plates? You know, what sorts of vessels were these folks buying? And that's where the vesselization comes in. So we can look at a site, excuse me, I've got this. 
got this banner at the top of my screen. It's making it difficult to see things. But here we have uh, the different activities. We can We can take those ceramic vessels and glass vessels too and go, you know, if we know what forms they represent, we could say, well, this is for food storage. This is for actually cooking. And this is for serving dinner on the table. And these are for beverages, you know, like tea wares, coffee wares. Um, and then we can we can total that up. And that's what food consumption is here. We've got 318 ceramic sherds, no glass. That just means we have 318 sherds that represent food consumption. As to, opposed to, for wine and liquor consumption, no ceramic. 2,451 shirts for wine and liquor consumption. This is mostly wine bottle fragments and wine glasses. So you get a sense of what this collection means right off, just from one part of the site. You know, there's a lot of emphasis on, on liquor consumption. Now, there were also indeterminate tablewares. So this, you know, we're not quite sure how these things were used, but that kind of evens up the numbers a little bit. But still... Uh, what we see here is liquor consumption, wine consumption, and on an elite residence like Bel Air Mansion, this probably represents not drunkenness, but sociability, hospitality uh, that the house offers to visitors of the same class. So other wealthy planters on this 18th century site. There, it's only about 63 shirts of ceramic and glass were for health related sanit uh, sanitation type stuff. And that could be a soap dish, for instance, a uh, pharmaceutical bottle, maybe uh, things, things of that nature. So here's a, a plate from a site out in just Northwest of Hagerstown, Maryland. And this is one way of vesselizing. You take all the shirts and you glue them back together again. And maybe you don't have all of them, as is the case here. Um, but it's pretty clear that this is a plate. It'd be even clearer if I could see the scale on it. Yeah, there's a scale there. Uh, and so that's one way of vesselizing. You just glue everything back together again, and you've got you know relatively intact plates, cups, bottles, etc. The reality of most archaeological sites, though, is it doesn't work that way. You're you're lucky if you make a few men's. Most of the stuff is just a bunch of disconnected shirts. But this plate, um, it's a bit of blue-edged uh, whiteware, I think, uh, and it would date to, I don't know, 1820s to maybe 1860. So, vesselization is an awkward. Ugly word, but that's the best we could come up with. And vesselization, we think of it as a, a method, uh, a way of uh, aggregating data, analyzing data that gives us some insight into the past. So when we're doing vesselization, what we're trying to do is determine the minimum number of vessels represented and the types of vessels. Types of vessels should be self-explanatory. You, know, you have plates, cups, bowls, et cetera. Minimum number, uh, what we do is we take our sherds and let's say we've got pearlwares, a type of ceramic from the very late 18th into uh, 19th century. If we take all our pearlware sherds and put them into a pile and then we separate them out by, let's say, decoration, you know, blue edged, green edged, uh, painted, uh, transfer print, different kinds of decorative motifs. And then we take those smaller piles and we go, well, these shirts, based on the rim shape, for instance, are clearly cups, teacups or coffee cups. These are plates. These are dinner plates. These are bread plates. And so we keep dividing things up. And we might have five shirts, five rim shirts of a pearlware plate. And they don't mend, but they all have the same diameter if we measure them up against a uh, 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 a pattern. Uh, same decoration, they look the same. So as far as we're concerned, for analytical purposes, those five shirts represent a plate. That's what I mean by minimum numbers of vessels. 
we're not necessarily learning exactly how many vessels were there. We're just trying to determine the minimum number of each type, and that will constitute a new database that's separate from our sherds. Doing this allows us to date uh, deposits and sites more accurately. Why? Uh, certain ceramics break up into little tiny pieces, and so you have a lot of sherds. Other ceramic types break into fairly large pieces, so you have fewer sherds. And so some ceramic types are overrepresented because they, they're very fragile, and some are underrepresented. They're relatively few sherds because they're quite robust, like American-made stonewares, for example. So use vesselizing and assemblage allows us to date a site more accurately because we're get we're addressing the, the shirt count uh, difference uh, reasonably well. We can examine uh, consumer choices. Uh, well, I mean, we okay, folks are buying Chinese porcelain. What kinds of Chinese porcelains? And partly we're interested in the in the decoration because decorations people choose say something about their aesthetic choices and maybe even their uh, religious leanings, uh, depending on the patterns. Uh, but the forms also, are they a bunch of tea wares or are they mostly wine glasses and wine bottles? A uh, short digress digression here. But back in the late 70s, I was a graduate student at Boston University and I worked for the Peabody Museum at Harvard at the same time. Well, I was in my uh, in an office at the Peabody Museum and we, we we could hear a backhoe operating out in Harvard Yard, digging trenches. So it's like, well, what the hell is that all about? So we go out, we find out it's the Met Metropolitan Transit Authority digging these utility lines through Harvard you know, for whatever kind of utilities. And so they had to stop and we had to investigate what they were hitting. And in these backhoe trenches going down four feet or so, we could see one layer after another, the most recent being the uppermost, the oldest being the lowermost. We were getting artifacts and bones out of each and every layer. Each and every layer produced the same kinds of material, sheep bones, uh, wine bottles, wine glasses, and tobacco pipes. The styles changed of the ceramics and glass. <laughs> But the vessel types, the wine bottles and wine glasses, were consistent throughout the deposit, saying something about college life over the last you know, nearly 400 years. That's the kind of information we can get by vesselizing an assemblage. And we start uh, figuring out, because I mean, there were also some ceramics too, but if you vesselize the collection, the ceramics were relatively few, the relatively few vessels represented, whereas there were lots of wine glasses and wine bottles. We can look at food presentation, you know, how are they serving food? Are they serving food in a bunch of bowls, which would suggest stews and soups? Or do we have lots of plates that suggest uh, chops and steaks and other sorts of things that you would normally eat off a plate rather than out of a bowl? And also, finally, we can look at depositional integrity, by which I mean, if we find just lots and lots of small sherds and none of them seem to mend and they don't seem to be any consistent patterns, that would suggest that uh, that particular deposit has been, uh, as we say, uh, the profession has been boogered up. It's been, it's been disturbed and therefore its research potential is fairly low. If we find a bunch of sherds that even if they don't quite mend, they're clearly from a relatively small number of vessels that suggests that that deposit has some integrity it hasn't been screwed up and therefore it's worth pursuing so here's an example uh you know we can look at uh there's a temporal dimension to this because ceramic wear types ceramic manufacturing uh produced uh, a, a, a series of styles over the years that we can recognize and date again mostly through museum collections but also for ceramics, those made in uh, the Midlands of England, uh, there are actually pattern books. You know, uh, these folks told us what patterns and what, you know, and those pattern books have dates. So we can actually date individual uh, decor decorative types. In order to do this, we need to know a little bit about uh, vessel anatomy, if you will. 
And so you don't need to remember any of this just to realize that we can divide sherds into different portions of a vessel depending on the nature of that vessel. These are stonewares. The one on the left is essentially a bottle. And the one on the right, I'm not sure what you'd call that. It's rather than a vase, I guess. It's kind of odd. Some other forms. These are, uh, again, are all stonewares. And we can look at different rim types. All this allows us to determine whether or not two shirts could be from the same vessel. Not are they from the same vessel, but could they be? And if they could be, then we consider them as part of one. So the process of doing this is we have this big pile of ceramic shirts and glass shirts. And usually what we do is we label the provenience uh, where each came from, or maybe the lot number, which tells us where each, uh, de which deposit each shirt came from, because we don't want to lose that information. Because we're going to dump all these things out on a table, big pile of stuff, and start sorting it. So we don't want to lose provenience information that's useful down the road. Uh, as I mentioned before, we can group by uh, decorative type. And within decorative, each decorative type, we can divide into the separate rims, bases, and body shirts. And based on those drawings I just showed you, we can say, what kind of rim is it? What kind of base is it? And that allows us to break it up into, uh, into smaller piles. And eventually, we group it into you know, individual vessels. And as I say here, if a shirt conceivably can be part of a particular vessel, for our purposes, analytically, it is. We can mend, then mend uh, those vessels. If the ceramic shirts will glue together, we can mend them. Or we can reconstruct them graphically. And I'm going to be talking about that in a moment. Uh, but most important is we're creating a new database. We already have one of the sherds, numbers of sherds from each deposit. But here we're actually going to list just the vessels, the minimum number of pearlware plates, the minimum number of American brown stoneware bottles, et cetera. And that, that, that becomes the data with uh, a separate data source that we'll use. And then we analyze those data, and I'll talk a little bit about that too in a moment. Where was my thing? <clears throat> so this is what uh, a glimpse of what our catalog will look like. This is from the uh, again the Go Plantation, which is uh, was near Bowie in Prince George's County, Maryland. And so each minimum each vessel, again this is minimum numbers. Each vessel gets a number one through whatever. Uh, we have a category for form. You know, is it a milk pan? Is it a bottle? Is it a mug, et cetera? Uh, what, what kind of activity does it represent? So processing in this case means food processing, and that would be a butter churn, for instance, uh, any kind of ceramic cooking pots uh, or non-ceramic. I mean, it could be metal too. Metal aren't, metals aren't excluded from this. Is it presentation, which would be a platter or an individual plate? Put on the table or a bowl. Uh, some things are indeterminate. We don't know. They're just not sufficiently complete. And then what kind of wear is it? Is it earthenware? Is it stoneware? Or is it porcelain? I'm not going to talk about the differences of those tonight, but if folks are interested, we can do a basic talk on just how do you identify different kinds of ceramics? How do you group them? And the type is those things, those categories that mostly archaeologists apply. Buckley, for instance, is a kind of earthenware made in the West Country of England. Uh, very characteristic, really thick, ugly looking stuff, thick black glaze. Uh, the clays, if you break it open, you look at the, the, the edge of the shirt, there are two different swirled colors of clay in there. Uh, and then the other columns, you know, feature, primary feature, secondary feature, tertiary features, like does that vessel show up in only one place? Does it show up in only one trash pit? Or does it show up in multiple trash pits? And we also have some dimensions in there that needn't concern us right now. But we, well, we'd like to be able to calculate how tall a vessel is, what its diameter is if it's circular, of the rim, and what's the diameter of the base. Because those three numbers allow us to reconstruct these on paper or with the computer. Which brings us to vessel reconstruction. 
This is the time-honored way of doing it. You get a bunch of sherds, and you try to glue them together. These these two vessels, a wine bottle on the left and a, uh, a mug on the right, a stoneware mug uh, made in England, uh, these come from the cellar hole of a house in southern Prince George's County. That house had clearly burned down and collapsed. And so we recovered relatively few vessels, but they were largely reconstructable like these. And they didn't glue together that well because the heat of the fire was such that all of the sherds have um, uh, warps from the heat. So, but you can glue them together well enough to figure out what goes with what uh, and what, what the forms are. But in most archeological deposits, this is not what we're finding. We're finding stuff that's much more fragmentary. This is a, uh, from uh, an 18th century uh, manor house uh, west of Upper Marble, Prince George's County. And you can see the upper left is a Chinese porcelain, um, I'm not sure, it's not a bread plate, it's something smaller than that. And lots of pieces of mended, enough to get a good sense, not only of the form, but also of the decoration, which is very Chinese. And to the right of that, we have a tea bowl that's Chinese porcelain. And you can just barely make out a little bit of painted design on it that was painted on top of the glaze and fired at a very low temperature. So it wiped off, it wipes off pretty easily. But it's a tea bowl. Uh, the lower left hand is a, is a, a tap for a keg, uh, for you know, a barrel of wine. But look at the one to the lower right hand corner. That's a glass tumbler. And I don't have a picture of it because it was too fragmentary. But because we had the total height of the vessel, we can calculate that. We had enough mended sherds, and we can uh, calculate the rim of the the. Um, we can calculate the diameter of the rim, and to calculate calculate the uh, diameter of the base, I was able to reconstruct this thing, and I did so with a computer program. But you can do it on paper as well. So this is the template we use. Uh, you could actually create your own with a pair of compasses. But uh, this happens to be in centimeters. I purchased this one. Uh, you could easily make your own on a computer or with a set of compasses on a piece of graph paper or, or whatever. And it's just a series of arcs. And these arcs allow you, you can take, say, the base of a vessel, let's say that tumbler, and we can put it on that template and we can move it until we find a, a line, an arc that corresponds perfectly to the arc of that base fragment. That gives us the um, diameter, which is indicated again here in centimeters along the uh, left-hand side and along the bottom. And also you could figure out if you start from the bottom, if you put it down near the bottom, you could figure out what percentage of that rim or that base survives, 5%, 10%, whatever. Uh, but it's the diameter that's really useful. These I did um, years ago as part of my doctoral dissertation project. But what I've done is I've taken sherds where I have the base, uh, rim to base profile. Where I've got enough mended sherds that I can't put the whole vessel together, but I can get its profile, which I drew. And once, and I've done this on graph paper. And once I uh, have drawn that, this is that uh, the lower drawing. This is that profile, kind of inked in uh, half of it. And I was able to calculate that because again, I knew the diameter of the rim, I knew the diameter of the base, and I can calculate the height of the vessel. I was able to kind of fill in the rest of it using a, a technical pen and just stippling. And what the stippling does is, it, I'm not I'm not an illustrator, I'm not an artist, um, but this works. And sort of stippling sort of the grooves that appear on the vessel, uh, the roll of the rim, and how the when light hits it, the kind of shadows to give it some sort of depth and dimensionality. And so this is a reasonable, you know, done by hand, a reasonable uh, 
facsimile of what this, in this case, a uh, sort of a dish looked like. Jim, I see how you got the, the diameter, but how, how did you get the height of that? In order to get the height, you have to have enough sherds that tie the rim to the base. So you might only have 10% of the vessel, but if it's the 10% where you you can fit or glue or whatever the, the, the pieces together from rim to base, okay. then you can calculate the the height. Okay. So you need you need rim diameter, base diameter, and the height. Now I've reconstructed a lot of vessels where I didn't know the height and didn't have the base. So I can uh, reconstruct, say, the upper part of a stoneware uh, crock, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, but to get something that's really useful, it's nice to be able, you really need that base to rim profile. Mm -hmm. And, you know, these things are kind of fun to do. And uh, years ago when I was working on this, I used to sit on the couch with my wife in the living room. She'd be watching TV. I'd be sitting there with a uh, a drafting board, a portable drafting board, and I go tap, 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 tap all night long doing those, that stippling. But it's kind of mindless, but at the same time, you're getting a decent product that's good for illustrating, you know, reports, publications, and, and talks like this. This is from Bel Air Mansion, and it's a stoneware, might even be a planter, uh, you know, something for planting a tree or whatever in. Uh, they were doing a fair amount of gardening there. Oops, I didn't mean to jump ahead. So I was able to reconstruct the uh, I was able to reconstruct the floral design on it. And American stonewares, it's very common to have a, a floral motif in blue, and the vessel itself is gray. But I had rim, uh, oh, plenty of rim to base profile there, so I can reconstruct it and you get a real sense of what, what this thing looked like, and therefore get some idea of how, how it may have been used. These are from a 17th century site, uh, Patuxent Point, Southern Calvert County. Uh, these are just bottles. Um, now, those on the far right-hand side are from, uh, I think, tin glazed earthenware. They're ceramics. But most of this is bottles. And for a lot of them, I didn't have rim to base profile, but I could still get a sense of what it looked like. And again, the same stippling technique. Uh, in this case, a lot of them I didn't bother with the um, uh, the blackened profile. The one on the far left is a uh, bottle, square in section, so sort of like a liquor bottle today. And the top, where it's threaded, that's pewter. Pewter was applied to it. So this is basically a twist-off bottle from probably the 1660s, 1670s. Uh, here's a stone, a Rhenish stoneware uh, mug, a bulbous mug. We have just fragments of it, but enough fragments that was I was able to calculate that again, rim to base profile, and you can see it on the right hand side. Now there's a little gap there, so I'm kind of fudging it. I don't have a complete base to profile, but I have a pretty good approximation. This is probably a pretty good view of what this thing looked like. Uh, I don't have the entirety of the handle either. 3D is, I haven't done it by hand in some years now. I do 3D reconstructions. Now, that requires a drafting program. You can probably get a uh, free uh, uh, open source, uh, free software for doing drafting. You might be able to do this. But uh, working years ago on this site, again, west of uh, Upper Marlboro, uh, a mansion site, uh, and it had a nine foot deep basement for an attached kitchen. And the kitchen was long since taken down. So it's just this deep foundation. In the bottom of, a, of that foundation was a pit about four feet in diameter. And that pit was just full of these wine bottle fragments. Now, the ones you see on the left, and you can see the one in the lower uh, right-hand corner in red, you know, that, that was just barely holding together. These were the ones I can reconstruct, I can glue together. But, you know, we had uh, a dozen bottles. So there were another half dozen that might have been 14, actually, all told. But there were a whole bunch of them that we couldn't reconstruct that way. 
but I was able to get that rim to base profile, draw basically a single line, and I'd put it into the drafting program and say, okay, this is the center point. This is the profile. Spin that profile around that central axis, 360 degrees. And this is what it produced, these wireframe models of bottles. The slide doesn't do it justice because each one of these is rotatable in 3D space, virtual 3D space. And not only could I rotate them and kind of look at them as if they were complete bottles, but the software also allowed me to calculate the volume of each bottle. And you'll notice that there's different, there's a difference in style here. The upper ones are what we call mallet-shaped bottles. They're shaped like a mallet that a, a woodworker might use. And the lower ones are what are called cup molded. That is when they were actually blown, the lower portion of it was in a sort of a metal cup that helped create that shape. So looking at the reconstructions, you see we basically have these two types of bottles represented. And with again, with the software, we can calculate the average height. The mallet bottles tend to be shorter than the cup molded ones. Well, we could see that just in the drawings. We could look at the variability because these things aren't machine made, they're handmade. So how much variability, how, how much alike are they within each group? Average diameter, variance of that, et cetera. But interestingly, we were able to get, again, the volume. The computer program could calculate the volume in cubic centimeters. And the average volume of the cup molded ones was around 50 cc's, whereas it was a little bit larger with the mallet ones. And also with the cup molded ones, there's more variability as a standard deviation of seven and a half as opposed to six cubic centimeters. Uh, like stamp thing in the line. Um, yeah, and I have the figure there. A quart is about 57.75 cubic inches. The cubic inches, not cc's. Uh, but that gives you an idea that, you know, neither type, both types were less than uh, an imperial quart. Uh, but they clearly, you know, there are clear differences there. What do those differences mean? I don't know. Uh, could one set of bottles actually have been used for gin as opposed to wine, or was it these wine bottle? Were these wine bottles made in a different place or by a different bottle maker? You know, who knows. But at least we have some data to work with, so we can start exploring some other issues. Now that we have forms, and this applies more to ceramic than glass forms, we can uh, start getting a better date. For instance. Uh, these are a series of dates from, this is actually from a book, it's from an archaeological site. It's a wonderful book by a fellow named Gene Comstock, who is a collector of Shenandoah pottery. Uh, I talked about Shenandoah pottery sometime last year, I think, or a year before. And it's a beautiful book. It's very expensive. Lots of color photographs. And he's got all these different uh, vessel forms that were made by potters in the Shenandoah Valley in the very late 18th and throughout the 19th centuries. And he has, gives dates for when they were made. And so I was able to put that range down for each type and calculate the mean date of manufacture. So the first one, 1850 to 1906, the median date would be uh, 1878, how many vessels were represented. And, and you know we could actually, if the book were an archeological site, we could calculate the mean date by using those forms. But what I use this for is when we work on a site in Western Maryland, we get cer ceramics and we uh, we can calculate dates uh, based on the type of ceramic. We can also vesselize it, use those forms and use this chart to uh, estimate the median, mean occupation date for the site. So this is actually from, um, this must be from Searfoss, but, um, you know, different vessel forms, stoneware, just stoneware, not looking at the earthenware, is the median date and the number of vessels. So I didn't do the arithmetic here, but we could uh, calculate the date from those forms. And then finally, consumer choice. What are people buying? Not just the types, but the forms. 
And what do those choices tell us about who those people are? And remember, we can also look at decoration, decorative motifs. In the 19th century, for instance, with so-called transfer printed um, vessels, which you probably most of you probably have something like that at home, they have scenes, you know, you, uh, courier and Ives type scenes, for instance, or maybe a sort of Chinese pagoda and tea gardens or Gothic uh, architecture with churches or the you know, these scenes with palm trees and whatnot that are, are referred to as Oriental and what they mean is a Turkish Ottoman. So look at the kinds of decorations that people choose for the ceramics they're going to be staring at night after night for some years to come. That tells us something about their aesthetic. But the forms are also informative. Uh, this is a glass prunt. I know I've shown it before in previous talks. That's uh, Kent Slavin on the Patuxent Point site, digging up what is almost certainly a 17th century privy. Uh, and he found this little piece of glass that's referred to as a prunt. It's a piece of molded glass that's attached to a vessel, as you see on the left. On the right is the actual is a picture of that prunt that uh, Kent excavated. And you can see how they were welded onto the stem of this German wine glass uh, called a Roma. Well, I mean, if you're finding something like that, if you find these German Romers on a site, what does that tell us about who these people are? You know, who were they connected with? Uh, what were they drinking? What did they think was a suitable uh, beverage? Now, we only found one prunt, so there's the minimum number of vessels would be, well, there's one Romer on that site. That's as much as we could say. If we found five prunts, we'd still have one vessel. If we found, um, uh, I don't know, two prunts, there were there were different designs, then we might say that there are two different vessels there. So two Romers. Now we can use uh, period uh, artwork. Uh, Dutch genre paintings are wonderful for, the, for this because you could see the kinds of vessels we dig up. You can see them in those uh, mid, let's say, mid 17th century Dutch paintings, and also later paintings by French and, and English artists, Scottish artists. But uh, to the left, you see this man and woman. He's being fresh with her. And on the floor in front of them is a brazier, uh, a, a Dutch brazier, like a little, no, I'm not sure. I mean, it's holding charcoal. And it's a tobacco pipe sitting on top of it. You know, presumably this guy stopped. He was, he was lighting his pipe from the embers in that brazier. And you can see that on the upper right-hand uh, side of the, the screen, a sort of close-up. Yeah, it's fuzzy, but it's a low-resolution image. Uh, and that painting is uh, Jan Steen from around 1660, titled The Tavern. So when we find sherds like that, of like that kind of vessel, that tells us where we have something that dates to around 1660. Uh, it suggests some sort of Dutch connection in trade or in ethnicity. Uh, it suggests a certain, you know, it's a brazier. It's not really something you would eat out of. Uh, and therefore, that suggests something about their lifestyle, what they're doing. Just as that tankard next to that nasty little dog, I think that's pewter, uh, that's a drinking ta uh, tankard. We never find those archaeologically, not around here, not pewter, uh, because it's reusable. It has value. Whereas if that brazier broke, that's it. It no longer functions. You throw it in the trash heap. Another uh, Jan Steen painting uh, celebrating the birth, 1664. Lower right-hand corner, there's this wonderful little skillet. It's a Dutch skillet, and you can see a close-up over to the right. Uh, we've found skillets like that at uh, Patuxent Point site. And at uh, uh, Patuxent Point at Compton, which is next to Patuxent Point. Southern end of Calvert County, whole bunch of ceramics are Dutch. And I've talked about this before too. And we, we found a number of these skillet fragments we can reconstruct and they're just like that one. So here's a drawing, here's a, well, the one on top is a picture from the Albany Institute of History and Art. They have a collection of, they had a collection of about 13 vessels that a previous curator had purchased uh, in the Netherlands and has that sort of celery stalk type handle. 
Well, we found one just like it at the Compton site, and this is it reconstructed, again, using that base-to-rim profile and calculating the diameters. And so these folks are cooking with ceramic skillets. Sorry, I know this is a little fuzzy. These are old drawings. Uh, but again, you see on the left-hand side are skillets and various sorts of disrepair. And the large vessel to the upper right, that's a uh, Dutch cooking pot uh, that we know was made in an area of the Netherlands called bergen op -Zoom, a city, bergen op -Zoom in the Netherlands. Now, so we've got reconstructed pot, and then we have pictures of these things from the Netherlands. The piece on the lower right-hand corner is uh, probably English, and it's a, it's a baking pan made of ceramic. This is a vessel from that Rife site, which again is northwest of Hagerstown, uh, 19th century. Uh, we've been able to, you know, clearly you can see we've been able to reconstruct a good part of it, enough to give us a sense of some sort of pan. You'll see little bits of white paper glued to it. Those are the labels that tell us the site number, 18WA454, and the lot number. And that lot number tells us exactly where on the site, what deposits that those sherds were, from which those sherds were recovered. All these sherds, I think, came from a, you know one or two excavation units next to one another. The stuff wasn't spread all over the site. And more vessels, again, from that same site near Hagerstown, where I did not have the uh, rim to base profile. So I couldn't link specific bases with these rims. So the best I could do is just draw the upper portions of these vessels. But you get a sense of what they are. Those on the left are basically like butter pots and sauerkraut pots. So, you know, you, you fill it with butter, you fill it with uh, shredded cabbage and vinegar. You put probably a piece of fabric over the top and, and around underneath that heavy rim, you could tie a string and that keeps that covering on tight. And so these are storage vessels. The images on the right are clearly bowls of different sorts. Uh, they're fairly large ones because you can see the, the scale, the very small scale to the far right, which is one inch. So each of these things looks like they're about seven, eight inches in diameter. So they're probably used for serving food at the table rather than for individual servings. Also from that same site, uh, this is a uh, locally made decorated earthenware. Uh, it's called slip decorated because you trail different colored slips on it and then put the glaze over the top. Uh, it's a very folk type pattern, uh, but a sort you'll see throughout Northern Europe and into Great Britain. And that were also made locally. This is almost certainly made in Shepherdstown area um, or, or uh, Hagerstown and made up to, you know, Eastern, Eastern to Western Pennsylvania, going up a little bit north and through in New England and down towards South Carolina, maybe. Different styles, but the same basic sort of thing. But here there are one, two, three, four, a minimum of five, and this one over the far right-hand corner, the well, far right-hand right side. I can't quite make out what that is, but it's clearly a different vessel. But here, using minimum, min doing minimal numbers, We've got at least six vessels, even though several of them look alike. And there we're using the different diameters. Those in the lower right-hand corner, those are smaller plates than the one above. Each of those arcs on that template that I showed you earlier, we could measure the diameter of the vessel using those that template. And that allows us to separate it out into different vessels. By the way, you can still get stuff like this, mostly made in Mexico. Folk art, red earthenware, lead glaze on the top with decoration. If you want to put them on your mantle, fine. Don't ever eat off of them. <laughs> uh, the glaze, because these are fired at relatively low temperatures, the lead glaze is not fixed to the ceramic paste. So if you eat hot meals off of it or eat acidic foods out of it, like sauerkraut, that lead will blend with the food and you will be ingesting it and it's no good for you. 
I've heard people say they think the American Revolution, the cause behind the Re American Revolution was that there were a lot of people eating off lead glazed earthenwares and it has definite effects on, on behavior. Yeah, these, uh, again, from that same site, these were easy to vesselize, I mean, because they're effectively intact. Uh, but because they're intact, or when you can pull enough pieces together, you could see the decorative motifs. And why would people pick, for instance, that plate with the urn and this sort of Eden-like um, uh, setting? You know, what does that mean? What did that mean to them? Uh, is this funerary? Uh, I mean, it's clearly classical in design, both the overall shape of the plate, but also that urn and uh, in, in, in the well of the plate. Uh, I can't see. It looks like the cup is of the same design. So I mean, they, how many piece setting did they have and what attracted them to this particular type? And it probably dates to around 1830 to 1860, somewhere in that ballpark. I'm not a ceramic specialist. There are some people who could nail a date on stuff like this very well. Again, from that same site, but this is a different pattern. Notice in the lower right-hand corner, uh, it's sort of a, what would be considered oriental design at the time, and also the top portion. Um, oriental meaning kind of Turkish, Ottoman Empire type thing. Uh, on the same site as that other design. You know, why did they pick this? Uh, uh, what is it about it aesthetically that drew them? Because you have a limited amount of money to spend on these things. Why buy this particular design? And this one here, same site. This is a Gothic pattern. If you look carefully, these are Gothic, Gothic buildings. These are, uh, they're all from the same set. Uh, the two lower ones clearly represent two different vessels because they have the same transfer print on the same part of the same transfer print but it's a gothic design which uh in this area we usually associate with goth uh, with uh, religious revivalism uh with a uh, strong kind of uh religious uh attitude expressed in the home not just in uh, a church or temple This is just sort of a fun little plate, you know. I mean, what's the what does this design mean? It's some sort of dessert plate. Um and uh it doesn't, you know, seem it suggests you know kind of nature. Uh, I don't know. Um each of these things, these these designs could have been bought in succession over a number of years. So what we could be seeing if they came from well dated deposits, we could actually see a change in aesthetic of the people occupying that site, which may be the same household, maybe a succession of households. So, um, so we're examining uh, deposit integrity. Uh, we, we excavate one layer of soil and we look at the material from that layer. What does it date to? Uh, let's say we have, this would be a lot, well, from a single locus. So we find 5,000 ceramic and glass sherds. Only 20 of those actually mend to one another. We've done some fairly extensive excavation. So we've got lots of stuff, but very little of it mends. And if we do a minimum vessel count, we come up with 400 separate vessels. What does that mean? And the, uh, the numbers I've made up, but the situation I've encountered Perhaps some of you attended the talk I gave some time ago about pig manure and swizzle sticks. Mm -hmm. I talked about how urban trash was shipped out to rural areas, fed to pigs, and then the resulting manure and whatever the pigs didn't eat, any bits of ceramic and glass, kind of all gathered up and spread across the fields. This situation might reflect that, that effectively these plates and glass, they, the Ceramic and glass sherds are from numerous households or numerous restaurants, and they're all kind of mixed together. And they have, and they don't tell us anything about any single household. Uh, we do cross mend analysis. This is pretty common in archaeology where you, you not only glue things together, but you keep track of where they're from 
did you glue two shirts, these two shirts you glued together, are they from the same excavation unit, say a five foot by five foot on a side? Do they come from adjoining units? Do they come from units that are spread, you know, or 100 feet apart on a site? If they're from 100 feet apart, that's kind of like, well, why do they mend? They had this plate blow up and wind up across the site like that. Uh, most cases, most of the bends we do are usually uh, very uh, from the same unit or from adjoining units. Uh, if they don't, that suggests the site's probably been disturbed quite a bit. And this is a common one. Uh, wherever I found these, what we call Iberian jars, these are large earthenware jars. They're like uh, Oyas in the Southwest, these large water uh, jars. Uh, they're not glazed on the outside. Not glazed on the inside. Uh, well, Oyas aren't glazed. Uh, but these are olive oil jars. And so the inside was glazed and they'd fill them up with oil and that would be you know, the basic cooking oil that folks would use. And they these things could be really big, some of them like almost four feet high. Big things. And we'll be digging a site and we'll find, they say, a rim shirt from what is clearly an Iberian jar. And that's it. We dig extensive excavation. We find not a, another shirt of it from these really big vessels. What does that mean? To being transported and accidentally dropped. Well, it's on the site, so all the other shirts, presumably there's trash being thrown out. So they, they threw out the rim, but where's the rest of it? I, I'll be honest, I don't know what it means. <laughs> I've got a couple of sites like that where we found one or maybe two pieces of Iberian oil jars or olive oil jars, and there's nothing else. Uh, rarely do we, in fact, the only entire jar that has ever been recovered that I'm aware of uh, was fished out of the Hudson River. So it wasn't even part of an archaeological site. It probably fell off a boat or something. At any rate, you know, vesselizing doesn't necessarily answer all our questions, but it does uh, allow us to pose new questions and, and, and come up with some interesting answers. So, um, Again, it's a it's a method. It's a method of determining, you know, we, we, we determine a minimum number of vessels and the types of vessels. Uh, those are really the two things we're after. And then we can use those instead of using shirt counts, using vessel forms, again, because some vessels fragment more than others, so they're overrepresented and they will affect things like our mean ceramic dating. So minimal, uh, minimal vet numbers of vessels uh, allow for more accurate dating of a site a better sense of the choices people are making, the, the forms and the decorations and whatnot, something about their diet, what they're eating, how they how they prepare food and how they present that food. And then finally, uh, depositional integrity. Uh, has the site been messed up to the point where it really doesn't have enough integrity to be able to ask a lot of interesting questions? That site up uh, in Searfoss, northwest of Hagerstown, was just such a site. I mean, we got lots of stuff out of there, but it was so buggered up that uh, I, I I didn't feel satisfied digging it. Anyway, I think that's it. Uh, so I'm open to questions. Hey, uh, Jim, I have a suggestion. Uh -huh. When you have missing pieces, you've got kids. They'll take rocks and break the broken plate up into bigger, smaller pieces. They'll also toss them away. For fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You could have kids. You could have a couple that maybe doesn't get along too well. I mean, there are any number of things. The problem is how do you how do you structure that into a testable hypothesis where you can refute what you're saying? How you how do you test that no hypothesis? You say, okay, I think this is going on. Well, if it isn't going on, then we should see this. How can you disprove your hypothesis? So you can come up with all sorts of just so stories, but um, yeah, you can you, you can't demonstrate, you can't prove them. Yeah. And to Compass. me, a, hy a hypothesis <laughs> has to be disprovable. If you can't test it and disprove it, it's not a hypothesis; it's a fantasy. I'm just—I don't care about that. All I'm talking about is from experience. What I did is yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, well, I tell you, you know, I grew up with two brothers, and we uh, had to do the dishes, you know, wash and dry, and we didn't break too much stuff. Uh, I'm surprised at the number of broken vessels we find on archaeological sites. Uh, you know, we'll dig a site, we'll come up with a minimum number of vessels, uh, 100 or more vessels. I don't recall breaking 100 vessels in my life. I don't know. You gotta be well, supremely careless. I've shot at jugs, broken them up with a twenty-two. I've thrown away yeah. stuff. You know, yeah. Get, things get, now, yeah, you know. I mean you could have something like that going on where you know somebody's doing target practice, but those shirts are not gonna wind up in a trash deposit. They're gonna wind up wherever you shot them. Uh generally if we're finding stuff in a trash deposit, especially if we got bone in there and burned plant material. Yeah, this is stuff that's being thrown out. It's all together. Um, it's uh, it's the best view we have of what they were doing. It is not perfect. Any other questions, comments, criticisms, complaints? Okay, well, if there's nothing else, thank you all for coming tonight.